So morning everyone, joined by Dr Veach and uh, Deputy Health Commander Dale Webster, who's also obviously running the vaccination and testing programs. Now we're continuing to see COVID case numbers plateau, as you'd um, recall, around a week ago, they were bouncing around between 1,000 and 1,300 per day. It's sitting around that six to 700 per day at the moment. Uh, importantly, with 726 cases confirmed to 8 p.m. last night, uh, there have also been 794 cases recovered and released from quarantine. So more people once again leaving quarantine. This brings our total number of active cases to 5,026 and total number of recoveries to more than 22,000. There are 24 people in hospital with COVID uh, and there are 12 people of that 24 that are being treated specifically for COVID symptoms. And there is no one currently in the ICU. Now, I want to speak just a little bit about schools. With schools returning in two weeks uh, and earlier for some independent and Catholic schools, the plan to provide back to school packs, which includes rats, masks and other information, are well underway. Um, and this will also include our early childhood education centres as well. Well, every child will receive a back to school pack, including two rats, a mask, COVID safety information, um, schools and early learning centres will also receive an ongoing supply of rats and masks as well. Now importantly uh, this will include masks for teachers and carers as well as students if they don't have access to their own as well as an ongoing as I've said supply of two rat tests per week for every child uh, and student um, and teacher uh, or carer. Uh, importantly our advice is that people should use these in the, the same way that we currently uh, apply tests at the moment. If you are symptomatic um, or a close contact, then these tests should be used. Now, packing of supplies for early childhood education and care se settings is occurring today and tomorrow with distribution to commence on Monday. This will be a click and collect system from distribution points which will be communicated to the centres and the Department of Education is engaging uh, with those centres and their peak groups. Direct postal and courier services will be in place for regional and remote centres. Um, weather's changing a little bit here. Uh, we're engaged with the Catholic and independent sectors as well uh, regarding supply of um, rats and masks and any other COVID uh, resources that they need. My understanding is that there is a further meeting on uh, almost as we speak at the moment, just in terms of that. You know, and we will supply uh, rapid antigen tests uh, and masks right across the sector from early childhood uh, education and care settings um, through to uh, independent um, and Catholic schools as well as obviously our own public schools. We made that perfectly clear uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago but um, that uh, seems to have been missed by some. Now packaging the back to school packs for government schools is underway with distribution of rats, masks and information to commence next week. And as I said, in many cases, um, as parents turn up to collect uh, their books, uh, they'll receive their back to school pack as well. Uh, and if we need to then uh, courier some out or get some distributed, then we will work through that to ensure that each parent can get their pack. Our schools are well prepared. Uh, the systems and processes are in place. Learning spaces will be well ventilated with outdoor learning areas optimised. And as we've discussed, um, that work is underway. Um, now, in terms of teachers with exemptions, and I know that there's been some public discourse about this, um, for a teacher to receive an exemption from being declared close contact, um, this will only occur if it is deemed essential by the school and the teacher is obviously not symptomatic and comfortable to return to work um, if they are designated as a close contact. And we'll work through that process. Um, you know, I, there's been some discussion about the fact that if you're a close contact um, as a teacher, you are uh, automatically you'll be put back into a classroom. Um, this is an exemption process and will work similarly to the way that we've got the exemption process in place at the moment. The key thing being that they must be not symptomatic, they must be comfortable to return to work. Now I also want to just mention the uh, relief teacher pool, um, which uh, as I've said we have around 1700 teachers in that relief teacher pool. Just to provide some context, um, in 2021 uh, we had more than 2000 individual relief teachers that um, worked for us throughout the course of the year. So I want to make the point that we do have a substantial pool there. Um, uh, some have been arguing that um, you know, certain uh, individuals may not want to return and that may be the case, uh, but we have a large pool and we will draw on that um, as and when required. 
Now, importantly, uh, the AEU have raised um, uh, some matters and we're engaging with the AEU and the CPSU later today uh, once again. I understand uh, that there have already been some discussions and meetings held. Public health will be a part of that discussion uh, to work through the plan that we have and to ensure that we can um, satisfy any concerns that, um, that may be raised in terms of um, the matters that uh, they wanted to raise with us. But I want to get right on the front foot with that. Um, you know, I've noticed some of the public discourse in other states um, with schools returning early uh, next week. It's, you know, we return on the 9th. We want to work through these things and make certain that people are comfortable with the plan that we have in place and public health will play a key role in having uh, those discussions um, which will be on this afternoon. Now in terms of exemptions, um, earlier this week we announced the extension of the exemption arrangement for businesses that had eligible close contacts um, uh, in critical uh, and essential uh, areas that they needed to return to work um, and we'll have a further trance that will be made available from 12 noon tomorrow. It'll be by application. I'll just once again just remind people uh, who will be included and that'll be health, welfare, care and support including production and provision of medical, pharmaceutical and health supplies as well as pharmacy workers critical to operations. It also includes veterinary, veterinary and animal welfare services, end of life services, dental services, critical welfare support services education and childcare services, telecommunications, data, broadcasting uh, and media services are also included. Um, we're also going to provide uh, an exemption process to supermarkets and grocery stores. Currently they have the exemption in place for shelf stacking, um, but if we get into a situation um, which at the moment I don't believe that we are in, um, and I'm hopeful that we won't get to, that where we need to bring some people back um, onto the floor of those either grocery stores or supermarkets, um, then there'll be an exemption process, but it will only be on the basis of critical and essential workers um, and by exemption. Uh, and we'll also be including the mining, forestry and timber resources sector as well in this. The full details of the final categories and the approval process will be released on the website uh, later today and applications will open from noon tomorrow. But I have to say, in terms of um, the numbers of businesses uh, which uh, I've indicated you know, did surprise me when we first introduced this. Um, we went, there were only 15 that applied on that first Friday, it went to about 39. Um, it's up over uh, about 140 businesses at the moment, 600 odd staff. Uh, the appetite has not been uh, what it has been in other states. Uh, but again, it's a tool that we've got that can provide options for people um, should we need to in those critical areas. One other matter I wanted to talk about very briefly as well is that you know, as we make the transition to living with COVID, and again I want to stress that point again, we are transitioning to where we can live with COVID. This isn't living with COVID. And importantly what we're seeing in terms of our broader overall numbers, um, you know, the trend is heading in the right direction at the moment. But it's important that we continue to review public health requirements. The check-in TAS app is one such process currently being reviewed. And while there's no change, and I want to stress this, there is no change to current policy settings uh, at the moment. Uh, a review is underway to determine whether the app should remain in place only for certain high-risk settings, such as aged care hospitals, large mass gatherings or festivals, um, etc. But that works underway and we'll have more to say in coming weeks um, as we uh, continue to transition, but I did want to flag that. And importantly, just a quick note on vaccination. Uh, more than 36% of eligible Tasmanians over the age of 18 have now had their booster. Um, that's around 60% of the people that are currently eligible right now for their booster. So around 60% currently eligible have had it. Um, and 36% of Tasmanians over the age of 18 have received it. Dale can um, provide more details on that in a moment if need me. Uh, importantly, if you're due, make sure you get it. We've got appointments available. Um, uh, if you're due for a booster, make certain that you book in and that you get your booster or utilise one of the other uh, networks to do so. In terms of um, Tasmanian children, 45% of Tasmanian children aged 5 to 11 have had their first vaccination prior to school. Um, I do want to once again stress that we have uh, available enough vaccine and enough appointments for every child in that 5 to 11 cohort to receive their first dose before they go back to school. 
Um, and I would say to parents, um, you know, this is not mandatory, um, but I would strongly encourage you. All of the advice that I've got is that this is the best protection that um, you can have for your child. So if you haven't got a vaccination um, appointment, please get one. And in finishing, remember it's the simple things that count. Uh, make sure that you wash your hands, cover your coughs and sneezes, uh, ensure that you wear a mask indoors, maintain um, social distancing uh, where possible. Importantly, stay home if you're unwell uh, and get tested. I'll hand over to Dr Beach. Thank you, Premier, and good morning. Um, I'd be happy to take questions if people have any for me. Um, we have seen the numbers continue to be basically stable and reduce slightly. There's no one in ICU now. Is that uh, lending weight to the idea that we have reached the peak of this wave and are on the downslope? I think we're past the peak of the wave. I think the fact that the community acquired case numbers have um, come down and stabilised around six, seven hundred means that we've plateaued, um, so we're probably past the peak. As I think I've mentioned, it's not clear to me when we'll see a further decline in that. Um, I would expect um, that there will be continue to be cases in the community, um, and whether it's as, as high as it is now for, for longer, or whether it drops down to a lower level of um, uh, community transmission, um, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, it's always the case that the more severe uh, cases of COVID uh, lag a little after the uh, peak of community cases, so we will always see the, the hospitalisation numbers uh, persist for a bit longer um, in intensive care admissions. It's, it's good news that we're not seeing uh, an accumulation of intensive care admissions, so I think that's all also consistent with us being past the initial peak of, of COVID. The we're still in the, the transition phase to living with COVID. This isn't technically living with COVID. Can you just give us an indication of what living with COVID might actually look like? Um, I'm just trying to get it. And how life will return to normal? What will it look like when we are technically living with COVID? Um, we live with a whole range of respiratory infections every year. Um, the one that we're most familiar with is influenza. Uh, and there are probably 20 to 40,000 people in Tasmania who get influenza every year. Um, and furthermore, there are you know, some people, who, quite a number of people who end up in hospital with influenza. Um, there are other respiratory infections, such as respiratory syncytial virus that comes around every uh, early winter, every year, and particularly infects young and primary school age children. And there are a number of other uh, viruses. It's my expectation that over time, and I don't know whether that's months or several years, we are likely to have um, SARS uh, coronavirus 2, the virus that causes COVID, as one of those mixes of, of uh, viruses. It probably occurs from time to time in our community, probably fairly steadily, but it may have seasonal peaks, but uh, we don't know yet what that looks like. COVID potentially be one of those diseases that we prepare for once yearly, like getting the flu shot, um, you know, and it might peak, say, over winter, that sort of thing. I think we're working our way th carefully through transition to lower level COVID. It's still quite common in the community now. I think it's a bit premature for me to paint a picture of quite what things will look like in six or 12 months' time. Um, but I hope and expect that, that it's with much less intrusion of COVID uh, on our lives than we're experiencing now. With the zero IC people in ICU, has anyone improved um, and, and headed um, towards positive, a positive outcome from ICU? I, I don't uh, have details on the clinical course of each person who goes in and out of intensive care. What kind of time frame are we looking to be in a position where we are living with COVID? How, how far away is that reality? I think I had a crack at answering that question in relation to your colleague uh, to your right. Um, I can't give you a precise time frame that we're going to step out of COVID in. Uh, uh, the Premier said yesterday that he is hopeful or sees that soon we'll be able to stop wearing masks, as opposed to having a mask mandate and to live without restrictions. 
obviously COVID can change, so we don't expect you to have a crystal ball, but do you, do you have a sort of a timeline for when you expect you might be able to recommend that we can drop the mask rules and, and what would you be looking for in terms of case numbers and hospitalisations to feel comfortable with that? I had a sense I've been asked the same question about three times, but I'll, I'll try and, uh, and answer it. Okay. Um, the first the first question was, are we there yet at the peak? And the next question was, are we are we there yet? Are we out of it? Um, and the answer, I think the Premier put it, is we're in transition. Things are changing uh, and people are really sick and tired of change. I think with COVID there was the threat of it, it's occurred, uh, it's still occurring, uh, they've had to adapt and change. And I get that people are sick of it and really want to know uh, when it won't be a dominant or important fact in their lives. I really get that. Um, I think we can reflect that Tasmania has done okay so far, uh, in the most part. Um, we have had per capita fewer cases uh, than most of the other jurisdictions have experienced during their um, peak of COVID. And the impact on hospitalisations and deaths has also been less per capita in Tasmania so far than in other jurisdictions. And I certainly hope as we transition out of it that that favourable set of circumstances uh, remains. I think we will be. We would want to see. Uh, uh, I, I, we would want to see a further drop in cases before I think I would recommend we take masks off. I think there's good evidence we've had from other jurisdictions' experiences that masks, masks help and attenuate the transmission in communities. So while we've still got a fair bit of transmission in the communities, I think it's sensible that we wear masks in the settings where we're more likely to spread it to each other in public settings. But given how we're seeing those case numbers sort of continue to steady and, and then potentially begin to plateau, there's no sort of set time frame of when they would be low enough that we could expect to not wear masks indoors anymore? Yeah, not so much a time frame. I think we would want to get to a situation where we've got fewer uh, COVID cases and I can't predict to you quite uh, when we're going to, if you like, bottom out at the trough of the, the wave. Uh, let's take questions. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Mr Webster, the Premier said about 60% of Tasmanians who are eligible for boosters have had theirs so far. Uh, that means 40% ha haven't. I is that concerning to you? Do you have a message to those people? Look, it is concerning. Um, people are eligible and we'd encourage them to come forward. And we have um, appointments in state clinics. Um, our community pharmacies right across the state are doing a, a wonderful job in, in offering appointments. So um, there are appointments. We'd encourage everyone to come. It's not mandatory, but it is an extra protection against COVID-19. And we want everyone to have that opportunity, which is why we're offering so many appointments across the state. So I was just going to say, what about um, vaccination for children between 5 and 11? Um, Catherine Morgan Weeks has said several times that the things like meningitis, our child vaccination rates are in the very high 90s and she'd like to see that replicated. What, why do you think um, we're still only sort of less than half of that age cohort being vaccinated so far for, for COVID? Yeah. I believe that it's a series of reasons and you know we still are in the, the holiday period you know people are away from their home base could be a reason the second reason is that a lot of people might be you know waiting and it, we hope they're putting it as part of their back to school pro, um, process and we'll make bookings over the next period and we're adding bookings today so adding appointments today that you know in case that's true and make sure that we've got enough in the diary to see people through to the 8th of February, 9th of February being the day the schools go back. And we just would like to reinforce that message of, if you've got a back to school list, add to the bottom of it, pick up your COVID-19 pack um, from your school and book your appointment. So we're really keen to give everyone that opportunity before the 9th of Feb to have their first dose. Um, and we'll continue to push that across the state. Um, we have clinics with spots this week in Olverston, Devonport, Burnie, um, Clarence, next week Bridgewater, the end of this week Montrose, um, next week at Smithton, we're at Hobart's MAC 2 over this weekend with um, super clinics um, and of course we're in South Launceston as well. So there are clinics available for 5 to 11s throughout the state. In addition to that there are GPs throughout the state. So if you 
would feel more comfortable taking your child to a GP, you can find the participating GPs on the, the national website, health.gov.au, but there are lots of appointments in state clinics as well. Will any of those clinics be offering walk-ins? Look, on a day-by-day -day basis, we do assess whether we've got enough capacity to do walk-ins, but the reason we're not doing walk-ins is we do need to manage the numbers in our clinics to make sure they are COVID safe spaces. So as you can appreciate with five to 11s, it's um, one booking might be two or three people. So we need to think about that and make sure that our, our clinics stay COVID safe. But on a day-to-day -day basis, if we think there's capacity there, we do actually put out messaging um, through Facebook and we contact radio stations, etc., just to advertise that walk-in. Is that likely to change though? I mean, clinics in the past have offered walk-ins, so. Yeah, as we get towards the, the higher numbers and we still have the clinics running, then we would probably offer walk-ins. But we are in a you know a situation in the past, we had walk-in clinics when we didn't have COVID in our community. We do have COVID in the community at the moment, so we do need to maintain our, our COVID safe spacing. Do you have the latest numbers on how many health staff currently are off work due to COVID? I, I do, yes, if you... Said that. Sorry, I don't have it. <laughs> I thought I did. So. How are we going to understand the full impact of the level three escalation at our hospitals in terms of elective surgeries? In terms of the full impact of, of the level three, it probably won't be seen for some time yet. And I, I would emphasize that we haven't stopped all of the areas. We, we've reduced services. So we're still providing elective surgery for category ones across the state or urgent category twos as well. But, and we assess that on a daily basis. So it will be some weeks before we can assess you know, the impact overall, but I would emphasize that we haven't stopped all services when we're in with level three. We've reduced the services and we're still providing you know, essential services, urgent services um, across the state um, in the health service. Just on uh, the vaccination for the five to 11 year olds, a lot of school age vaccinations actually happen at school. Um, will there be, I suppose vaccination offered at school children who haven't yet got the first dose by the time they school returns and I suppose for the second dose would that be offered in school the way it was with colleges and so on. Look, at this stage, we would encourage, we, we're aiming to get everyone done by the 9th of February, so before school goes back. So there is no reason to set up clinics in schools at this time. But of course, we'll make assessments once school's back. And if there's a need for us to, to put a clinic in a school, we'll do that, as we did with the, the earlier age groups. With dose two, we've, we've set up them to be convenient to parents as in evenings and, and weekends. So that we've got some certainty of booking um, as we go. Um, but we'll assess on the 9th of February, how far did we get? What are our gaps? And we will put clinics where they need to be. I've never jumped back before, but I thought that there was an important point that I wanted to make after thinking a little bit more about the questions that you asked and the answers I provided. Um, I think one of the reasons why Tasmania is in the situation it is now with plateauing out of our first peak um, is our high vaccination coverage uh, and that's we can't underestimate how important it is for uh, the achievement we've, we've made in getting so many of our population vaccinated uh, with two doses to I think just over 95 or just on 95 percent of the 12 plus population and we're heading towards half of our 5 to 11 year olds. Uh, that's tremendously important as an explanation for where we are now. Now, the other question, which is, how do we get out of this? When will we get out of this? And how low will we go? Uh, also depends upon vaccinations. Uh, getting rid of our masks depends upon getting to that low level of uh, COVID in the community um, also. Um, so it remains tremendously important that we finish the job with the vaccination so that the people who are eligible for boosters 
get boosted. That's going to keep them out of hospital and keep them out of intensive care. It's important that young and middle-aged adults who haven't got started with their course yet, go and get it now. And it's important that parents um, discuss with their providers and get their younger children vaccinated. So I just thought it was important to put that context into my answer from before. Thanks. Thank you. Just um, and a couple of answers to questions. So in terms of positive health staff, 93. And in terms of the ICU, my understanding is that um, those patients have moved out of the ICU. The National Cabinet, there is advice expected from a target surrounding man mandating those third COVID jabs or boosters. Are, are you expecting um, some answers around that today? And, and what, in what context would that be provided in, in Tasmania? Again, um, we'll wait on the, uh, the advice from ATAGI in terms of whether or not the third booster becomes the uh, requirement to be fully vaccinated. Um, obviously, that's being considered. Um, what that would mean if that were to be the case is that you know, we would just simply be encouraging people to take on board um, the booster up opportunities that are available at the moment. Um, and as we've discussed, there are uh, appointments available for those people who are due uh, and eligible for their booster right now. And I just simply encourage people to um, uh, step up and uh, make those appointments. Does that mean somebody would potentially need a third dose to enter certain healthcare settings and, and Build things like we're seeing now with the, the double dose? Well, again, um, you know, we look at the, in terms of our mandate, um, fully vaccinated has been two doses with a third booster. If that were to change, not take public health advice in terms of what we might need to do in terms of the uh, mandatory arrangements that we have in place, plus the advice that uh, we provide to businesses who have conducted their own risk assessment. And what's the reason for um, mining and forestry workers to be included in that close contact exemption? Well, in terms of, I think, um, Forestry is probably a, an easy one. In fact, um, we know that um, supply chains across the country in terms of building materials are um, under pressure. And so if there is a, uh, you know, as part of the supply chain, um, the close contact exemption can be uh, requested if it's essential and critical. And likewise with mining, um, you know, in terms of um, the mineral resources and the mining processes that we have in the state, they are vitally important at the beginning of the supply chains that we all engage in. Parents choose to not send their children to school because they're concerned about their safety. Will you consider disciplinary action against them? No. No, I won't. Um, and the Education Department will be quite clear on that. What I would say, though, to parents is that um, you know, the advice that we have, the very strong advice, is that the best place for a child for their learning and their well-being is at school. Uh, and importantly, we know from the empirical evidence now that you know, for the vast majority of children, um, this illness is very mild, um, should they get it. It is true that under the school's plan, children who are kept home from school, not because they're isolating and not because they have a supposed certified med medical exemption, they won't be provided with the online learning resources that those other children will be, will they? Oh, no, look, in fact, um, if need be, we will ensure that every child can have access to the virtual learning centre. Um, you know, look, I'm not going to cut corners on this. Um, I understand that some parents are anxious. Um, however, I would say to parents you know, that the, the very strong advice is that the best place for children is in school in terms of their learning and their wellbeing. Uh, and the steps that we put in place um, are designed to ensure that we can provide safe learn, a safe learning environment for them. What, what uh, level of response have you had from those 400 retired teachers and other education workers? So not the relief teacher register, but those others that you were contacting. I know some have received, I think, letters already by um, Express Post. What, how many, what proportion have so far said yes? Will, will oh, look, I don't have that detail at hand. Um, yeah, I can see if the, um, the education department's got uh, some information that they can share. But again, it's um, very early days in terms of that. But. Uh, we understand some of the uh, the appetite for this, and if we can provide some detail, we will. Council is going to put forward a notice of motion to see if we could settle some asylum seekers from the Park Hotel here. Is that something that you would support? Well, can I just say, at the moment, um, that's not a priority of the government. Um, however, um, you know, if the Commonwealth um, wanted to raise that matter, then we'd certainly have a discussion. Um, I note the um, the motion that's going before the Hobart City Council. Uh, tonight, and it'll be interesting to see uh, how that proceeds. 
but as I've said, it's not a priority of the government, but we'd always engage with the Commonwealth. Um, you know, right now, our priority is ensuring that we can get our kids back to school. Importantly, um, that we can manage um, uh, COVID. So discussing a motion tonight to end the e-scooter trial that's happening at the moment in the city. Um, last year, lots of shots of you on a scooter, um, announcing legislation that will enable the use of those scooters on roads and footpaths and so on. Um, are you rethinking any of those laws that you made then? Do you think they need to be tweaked to improve the safety of the use of the e-scooters? Well, in terms of um, the laws, um, what we did is we, we provided the access and the regulation to enable it to occur. Um, the council can determine um, what streets uh, and uh, what footpaths those uh, scooters are ridden on. And so the tools are there within the council's hands. Um, I would hope that they don't have a knee-jerk reaction to you know, what has been, you know, potentially could have been some quite serious um, accidents as a result of this, uh, and that they proceed cautiously and, if necessary, that they use the levers that are available to them um, should they wish to make zones safer. Also, they can engage with the uh, two scooter companies that are a part of the trial and obviously the geo uh, fencing that can occur in terms of where those scooters can go, the speed at which they can be ridden is also something that can be looked at. So I believe that the tools are there to ensure that the that scooters can continue and I hope that there's not a knee-jerk reaction um, by the council uh, in terms of what it, uh, has been I think broadly a very successful trial uh, and one that's been uh, well accepted and um, taken up by the community. You told the citizenship ceremony in Launceston yesterday that soon we won't be wearing masks, soon we won't be living with restrictions. What did you mean by soon in that in that? Well, I think you actually, the ABC actually covered it off last night in their intro, I think, when uh, they said that uh, you know, I was indicating in coming months. Um, you know, and I would hope, and as you've heard from Dr Veach, um, you know, we are in uh, a very, very reasonable position at the moment. Um, as you've heard this morning, um, we passed the peak. Um, you know, we have plateaued at six to seven hundred cases, you know, and hopefully that's going to continue to go down. You know, as Dr. Veach has said, you know, one of the most important tools that we have is vaccination, and I would encourage those that are due a booster to get that vaccination. I would encourage parents of five to eleven-year-olds, and importantly of twelve to fifteen-year-olds, to ensure that if they haven't had a vaccination, that they do so. You know, it's not mandated, um, but I would strongly encourage it because our vaccination is our best um, defence against COVID. And importantly, that will help us, as you just heard from Dr Veach, to drive that curve even lower. So in terms of um, the future, you know, I would hope that in coming months, we could be a, at a point where public health had the confidence to say that you know, the incidence of COVID in our community is such that we can start to step back from some of the restrictions that we have in place. You know, I'm quietly confident and optimistic that that's going to occur. But again, the most important thing that we've got to do is ensure that case numbers continue to fall. Um, and I'd make this point as well. You know, I would fully expect that with the increased movement around schools, that we may see a slight tick up in cases as we move forward. That's to be expected. It's nothing to be concerned about. Um, but again, if we continue to do the little things, have good hand hygiene, cover our coughs and sneezes, make certain that we socially distance, when indoors that we wear a mask and importantly that we get vaccinated and boosted if that's available to us, um, that we do that because that is the best way that we're going to drive those numbers down and we're going to get to a point where we can have our lives back. Thank you.